This polyphonic synthesizer gadget is optimized for 8-bit or quote-unquote chiptune sounds. The timeless waveforms that still exemplify the sounds of a computer are provided in the oscillator section. And there are also jump and run functions that make those sounds even more bizarre. You can also use effects to additionally modulate the sound. So this Kingston gadget is based on the NES system that came out in the 80s and 90s. So let's take a look at the NES sound chip uh, made by a Japanese electronic company called Rico that still exists today. The sound chip is called the 2A03. The Rico 2A03 or Rico 2A07, depending on what region you lived in, is an 8-bit microprocessor manufactured by Rico for the Nintendo Entertainment System video game console. The Rico's 2A03's sound hardware has five channels separated into two APUs. APU stands for Audio Processing Unit. The first APU contains two general purpose pulse channels with four duty cycles. And the second APU contains a triangle generator and a noise generator and a 1-bit delta modulation encoded PCM. That's DPCM for short. While a majority of the NES library uses only four channels, later games use the fifth DPCM channel due to cartridge memory expansions becoming cheaper. For example, Super Mario Bros. 3 uses the DPCM channel for simple drum sounds, while Journey to Silius uses it for sampled bass lines. The Kingston gadget has a very unique and lovely look. It's based on a arcade machine, and on top you have your arcade marquee with a person punching another person with a weird circle starburst, which is pretty awesome, and next to it the Kingston logo with a nice font and uh, coloring on the lettering, and the word chip synthesizer under it, and you have the Korg logo in red. Then on the left side, you have the menu for your presets, which is in a purple screen with black text, which is pretty awesome. And the lines give me a nice synthwave feeling or 80s feeling. Under that is the interface. It has red and black knobs that reminds me of the NES. And it has red and black arcade buttons. The rest of the layout is uh, purple and blue. And on the bottom you have a nifty slot for your quarter or your token and it has the little one token symbol on the right side and next to it is a coin which is a nice aesthetic to the arcade machine. Also in the screen it has a very lovely interface with a nice color uh, blue and white and the screen also has scan lines with bright scan line traveling up and down to give it a unique effect. The font is the average 90s or 80s computer font, which is pretty cool, and it's nice. On the bottom is your keys, that you have your white keys, and the black keys are a lovely shade of dark blue, and next to it you have your metallic scale and octave buttons. It's encased in a nice plastic uh, purple lining with the wooden, I guess, purplish blue or whatever the blue is you got there, but it's very nice. I like this gadget a lot and it's pretty fun. The design is very, very fun. So this is the first section of the Kingston gadget. This is the waveform section. Here is only five main waveforms. So your first waveform is the triangle wave. That is used on the NES for mostly based on games. It's just a simple triangle wave. It can't be shaped into nothing else. Here on the gadget, 
you can do a release like so but you wouldn't hear this in an nes game there is no release it's either on or off that's it so on to the next waveform we go into the duty cycles these are the two squares in the first uh, APU. So the first one is a square wave, or what I would call also is a 50% duty cycle, and that makes a perfect square. So we call it the square wave, and it makes this sound you know about. And then the next waveform is the called the 25% duty cycle. And it makes a sound like this. And then the last one of the duty cycles is goes even half of 50 and half of 25, so it goes down to 12.5. So this is the 12.5 duty cycle, and it sounds like this. And the last wave here is a noise wave. This makes a noise channel uh, or a noise sound similar to what you hear in TV static. But this channel can be used also for drum sounds. So if you put it on a low release and the sustain and a decay. Now that we heard these waveforms, let's check out the same waveforms used in NES games. Okay, so I was going to take these uh, figurines and put it out for show, but um, they look like it, this is Luigi right here. You know, those old uh, Pixel light-up things. And from the camera, it looks like I'm holding up a ghost or whatnot. If I put it up here, yeah, it'll start fading away. Now you can see the detail. But everything else is dark. And then back here, it's just white. But I can use this as a platform, and I can put another one here. So I got the Super Mario Bros. 3 Mario. And the, the Mega Man right up here, and bam. Two things here. But anyway, so this is the transpose section. All it does is just takes your pitch and puts it up an octave or down an octave, depending uh, where you set it at. So we have your C here. Then I put it up, I put it up again, and then same thing back down. I guess it's great if you wrote a whole part and you don't feel like moving it up and down and you can change it and whatnot, uh, but that's a transpose. So this is the envelope section here, and you know what this is already. You have your attack, decay, sustain, and release. And let's go through real quick. There's nothing here, so you're going to hear this on the square wave. 
nothing. Everything's on zero. If I put the attack only, you hear the uh, volume from zero to 100%, and then it goes to zero. Shorter attack. I put that down. Now the decay, the decay is how fast it goes to 100 to sustain level. So it should be 100 to zero. Shorter. And then sustain is just another volume level. It's what volume the decay will go along, uh, will go to from decay to the sustain. So and then the release is from, if I'm guessing right, it should be from sustain to zero. So if I have it this high, it shouldn't play anything, but let's see. As you can see, release is not working. I mean, it is, but it's going zero to zero. So let's put some sustain and we should get a sustained volume to zero. Remember, it's when I let go of the button. So, As soon as I let go. If I don't, it stays in that volume with the sustain. So that's another way we're studying the uh, ADSR, the volume envelope. So you should check out my other videos, especially the Chicago one. The Chicago one gives you a way that you can imagine these uh, volume things. And I do show the oleoscope. Uh -huh, it looks like so you may want to check that uh, Chicago video it was the episode before this one so you may want to check that one as well and let's get to the other page now now that we are done with this section if you hit the button to the right that says effect you go into the effect screen and this is just like the other effects screens, except there's about a small amount of gadgets that have its own unique effects. Or basically it just cuts down the number of effects that just have a little bit there most of the time. So you got your uh, equalizer right here. And then you have your compressor. So you would raise the left one to get a snap. Uh, you may not hear it that well, so let's go to the noise channel. You know, you know the compressor is great for drums, so you can hear that pop in there. And then the second one, it fades it, it fades, it adds an attack to it. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't do too much for the Kingston. And then you have a lo-fi. Let's go back to the uh, square wave. Now, lo-fi is a very uh, interesting effect because only a small amount of gadgets use it. It's not really part of all the gadgets. So I think there's only two gadgets. This one and the uh the actual lo-fi gadget the uh let's go there real quick i forgot the name of it so oh yeah the helsinki but uh we'll go back to that later that looks weird all right so that's the lo-fi and then you have your ring modulation and then you have your chorus flanger it's kind of weird because chorus is on the left side and flanger's on the right, but it needs a little flanger for the chorus to work. But if you need some chorus, you can always use the assemble. You know, if you need chorus about the flanger. And you know, the first one controls the uh, 
separation i think no the first one controls the okay the first one controls the uh two notes for the chorus how much of you want of two notes and the second one controls the separation if you're wearing headphones you you will hear this or if you have good speakers you will hear it too But it sounds just like you need a little bit of the first one just to get the second one to activate for some reason. And then you got the pump, you know, the, you know, you pump the uh, beat up and whatnot. So uh, what the pump is basically is, is like the uh, tremolo, but it goes on the uh, beats per minute. So it makes the uh, uh, volume up and down. It makes the pump um, tempo. Okay, so the first one controls the speed of the pump, and then the second one controls the uh, volume of the pump. So if there's more, then there's a big difference between zero to 100 volume. But if it's less, then you can really hear what I'm talking about. Oh, the pump can also be called sidechain as well, but I, uh, sidechain can do anything besides volume. So that's why I guess they call it pump better instead of the sidechain, but it is a volume sidechain. Sounds better right here. So that's cool if you need to get your side chain in, that's pretty cool. So you got your pump, and then you got your natural last for the uh, effects. That's pretty much in every gadget, your short delay. As you know, the first one controls how far the delay is short delay is like bpm delay but it's like super short very very short so you have you can fine tune your delay to the millisecond compared to be uh to the beats per minute delay so right here is a super short delay it's also great if you want to get that super nes reverb but that's for another uh video so and then if it goes farther up the delay gets delayed, you know, it's a little bit late, but not as late as BPM because it's a short delay. And this is how long you want the delay to last or how many notes it's going to hit on the delay and play. How many notes is going to play on the delay. And then you got the beats per minute. So same thing like the delay, but it's uh, synced to the tempo. Um, the second one controls how many, just like the, exactly like the short delay, the second one controls how many notes you want to play uh, in the uh, delay. And then the first one controls the, how long the delay is. Since it's a beats per minute, it can go very long. And then you got the whole reverb. So you got your reverb. Uh, the second one controls the timing. What the first one controls, though? Okay, so the first one is how much reverb you want, actually. And then the second one is how long you want the reverb. And then you have gate reverb. So it's like a gate. Uh, which is uh, open and close gate. So as soon as I let go, it just stops. So how much reverb you want, and then how, let's see, maybe the gate is smooth, let's see.
If I put this up, it gives more reverb. What's the left one? I can hear the separation go stronger and a little echo too. So I guess you can say how much reverb you want on the left one and then how strong it is on the right one. It's kind of hard to explain, but uh, you figure it out from ear. So that's your effects. And that's pretty much it for the screen. So as you know, I know you guys don't use Kingston that much. But uh, Kingston does have two things that are really cool that stand out compared to other gadgets. I'll go to the less one and into this little secret weapon into the next section. So this is the jump section. Let's get this out the way. This is the level. That's just the volume. Uh, it's one of the knobs that have a full graphic on it. So it actually looks pretty cool when you uh, turn it around. That's pretty awesome. Anyway, so that's your volume knob. Okay, so we're talking about the jump. What the jump is, it's basically a pitch bend. So right now, it doesn't do anything because it needs to be activated. So you just hit this cool little uh, arcade button. And it's on zero. Uh, it doesn't do anything. You have a negative 10 and a positive 10. So if I go negative 10, it's going to go down. Okay, you can't hear that because the note's too low. So let's go to the edit and let's transpose uh, up. Well, you know, the transpose is actually useful. So let's try it now. Okay, that didn't work. Um, maybe it needs some decay or sustain. There we go. Let's Let's figure this out together. I'm going to put everything down. We're going to have the attack. Let's see. Nothing. Let's try decay. All right, let's try sustain. Nothing. Release, I'm assuming. All right. So uh, you need a little decay here to get this thing working. So like I said, when I press the button, it goes down. It's on 10, so it's very fast. And it seems on the release, it goes back up. And if I go the other direction, it's going to go from, uh, it's going to go up. Now we got to transpose down. Now, uh, you could do some cool effects with this. But if you want to make those nifty 8-bit tom drums, you go to negative 10, go to low decay. Well, transpose up. All right, what's going on? Let's see. There we go. Uh, triangle. Although. Funny thing, um, I made it here, and you can see they put some stars on here. And I have the something bass and the something drum. And if you are thinking what I put on here is what you think it is, it's not. It's not. Get your mind out the gutter because this is the Folin bass and the Folin drum from Tim Folin. But of course, I think Core Gadget has like a one solution thing to detect between the words, uh, uh, between two letters of F and, you know, and K to see what goes in there. So, I mean, sorry, F and N to see what goes in there. So Folin can also sound like a dirty word too. 
So I can't put Fallen Bass or Fallen Drum. Maybe if I try Tim Fallen, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save the user preset. And let's check this out. See, I'm gonna put a space on here. Let's see what I get. Look at that. See? It blocks Fallen's name out. You know, I don't even know if I'm spelling it right. Am I spelling it right? Yeah, see? There we go. The, uh, oh my god, the camera's so low here. Fire here. So yeah, I'm spelling his name right. So let's try. Why have I put it together? Hey, it works. Okay, maybe I'll do it like that. So this is the jump. It's used for a pitch bend and you can make a lot of cool uh, video game sound effects with it and some other stuff, some 8-bit precaution and get some cool effects out of it. Uh, so let's go to the last section and I think, no, I know, it's, I like to call it the secret weapon of the Kingston, which is pretty damn cool. So uh, let's check it out. Okay, so this is the best part of the Kingston. You are introduced to this when you pick the uh, first, well, when it loads up the first uh, template, and it's called the run. Now, the run section creates an ARP. It allows you to create an ARP, and I'm going to break it down for you after messing around with it for, uh, you know, last night for a very long time. I just realized something here. Okay, so you have your ARP type here, and you have your speed down here. Now, the ARP types are very similar to the Chicago ARP types, except you get a little bit more. And even though you see seven ARP types here, there really is only three ARP types. Four, if you count the last one, which is random. But let me show you that. What you have is you have three main ARP types here, and the other three are actually the same ones as the other ones, except they're inverted. So we're going to load the speed down here. So the first art type just goes uh, two octaves. I'm going to play it without it. So we're going to hear our note. We got the C note. Excuse me. Okay, we got the C note. And look what happens when I turn it on. You can hear that it's playing. Uh, I'll slow it down for you. a little too slow so you can hear it's playing the higher octave first and then it goes back to your note and that's it that's all it's doing it's playing the higher octave and it goes down to your note and then the second one You can hear that it's playing two octaves higher, then it goes down to the next octave, then it goes down back to your note. So it's like the first one, just with another octave thrown in. And then the third one. If you guessed it, it's the same thing, just another octave higher. So you have the octave. Uh, the third octave, then down to the second, then down to the first, and then back to your note. And then again, and then it loops again. Now, as you go to the next one, you start to hear this now.
it's the same exact ARP as the last one, except now it's in reverse. So now it actually plays with R note, which is probably maybe a little easier to use. So it it plays with uh, R note, and then it goes up the three octaves. And then the second one is just like the other one before that one. So it's gonna be only three octaves now instead of four. Reverse just like the other one. And then the last one here is just two octaves, but now it starts on note. And I go back to the first one. And then, so you can see here that these three are just the other three, just inverted. And then the last one is random. So it's pretty random. Sometimes it can hit the same note three times or four times, but it's random there. And you can hear this better with a higher speed. So we'll go to a higher speed now. Okay, so this is the run section. I know you're looking at it and you're like, well, what's so special about it? I mean, it just does the octave things. Well, there's a cool thing here, and I'll show you this uh, with the... I'm going to show you it in the, uh, with the note thing. So we're here at the note screen, and we're going to play a note here. I'm going to write one here, and you're going to hear the ARP. So that's the uh, one note there. And we're gonna put another one. That's another note. And we're gonna add another one. Okay, so what happens when you play it together? So what's happening here is that it actually plays all the notes that you press in a chord. I'll use my keyboard here. I don't know how many notes you can do, but I did like 10 and it still does it. So it's a pretty cool thing you can do with this gadget. You can play these chords and the ARP will go through it. And then you can multiply them with the different sets of the uh, type and speed. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the problems I have with Kingston. So I have a love and hate relationship with the synthesizer. So on the right side here is Famitracker. And this is what I use to make real NES music. Because uh, I do work on NES games. And this is how I make my music on there. So let's take a listen real quick. Oh. All right, so that's uh, music on there. I use a lot of tricks, a lot of layering and stuff. But we're going to go to the Pulse 2 here. Uh, just like the NES, the first two uh, pulses are right here. And then the triangle noise and DPCM is right over here. 
and I only use four channels. So I use the triangle drums to get the uh, heavier drums and whatnot on here without using samples. Anyway, so we got Pulse 2. So you can hear the sound here. I'm going to go to instrument 15. I'm going to play a couple of notes on my keyboard. And what you can hear is, I guess, the most notable thing. We'll go to the first thing. Uh, the very first thing is why I don't like about the Kingston. For some reason, it doesn't have a mono option. So if I go back to my Kingston on my keyboard and I play notes like this, it sounds all right. It sounds just like the NES because I have no release. But if I put the release up and I start playing multiple notes, now I get this tail on every note that layers on top of each other. Something that I cannot do on one channel. So now if I want to have a release and have it interrupted, I can't have that. So that kind of sucks. So that really hurts me on trying to get a nice authentic NES sound. Another thing is, if I go back here, Do you hear the vibrato? That's another thing. I can't have vibrato on these notes. Uh, I can't even get a vibrato on the effect. Well, a little bit, let's see. Okay, it doesn't sound good. I can't get vibrato. So that's another problem too. I can't get a vibrato on this and a lot of uh, songs use vibrato. Most notably, uh, Legend of Zelda uh, Part 2, the sequel. It has a lovely vibrato, uh, classic vibrato sound. So I can't even do the Legend of Zelda music if I want to on here. Well, I mean, like the original, yeah, you could probably do it on here. But the part two, if I want to, want to do part two, I cannot do that on here. So you can't do vibrato and you can't do mono. About everything else I think you can do. And then you can't mix waveforms together. That's another weird thing. Even the newer systems can't do it, like on the NES. So right here, this is the waveform. I'm using waveform 2, which is the uh, this one right here. No, waveform 2 is actually the square wave. I'm using that, and then I go to this waveform, which is 0, and I go to this one, which is 1, and then back to this one, which is 0, and it makes that sound. If I delete it and just leave it on 2, it sounds like this. And I lost my waveform. Let's put it back in. So I can't make those weird uh, sounds that I want to on here like the NES does. And I think that's the only problems. Uh, uh, so while on the Kingston, you can play chords like uh, this little shot I take. Um, you see, you notice when I was doing some tests on earlier on the notes, I was only using two notes because that's the limit of amount of notes you can play on the NES. And that's how you get to authentic NES sound. If you start playing more notes, then it won't sound like the NES. It'll just sound like video game music or what people call Mario music or whatever, you know, but uh, it won't sound authentic if you want that nice sound, if you're trying to go for that.
All right, so we learned about the Kingston right over here, up here, floating here in the screen. And, you know, it's an awesome gadget. I really love it. It's a love letter to the NES, but it was designed more for making cool sound effects and just putting 8-bit sounds into your music than actually using it for 8-bit music. But you heard some of the samples I created, including... If you did not know, every episode I make a theme. Actually, I'm going to play it right now. So the music you're hearing in the background is what I made on the Kingston. And you can see it sounds authentic only because I just took a couple of... Uh, I just parodied a couple of, you know, things that normally that NES games do to sound like NES. Using only two notes and then taking advantage of the echo and then... Uh, I took the London and turned down the uh, the frequency to create that uh, DPCM sound you hear at NES games for a nice drum. But anyway, you know, the cool thing about the Kingston is the run option. The ARP option is amazing. You could do a lot of cool stuff with that. And then you have the jump, which is awesome. So when it comes to NES sound effects, you can create almost like any sound effect you hear on the NES with this thing. Not everything. Maybe I guess you put a little work. Like, I don't know if you can do... You could do the, the warp zone sound on the Super Mario Brothers, but you're going to have to do it by notes. So some sound effects, you need to use notes at a high tempo. But you should be able to do it, no problem. So, other than that, you know, the little problems, no vibrato and no... Uh, mono mode it kind of hurts it a little bit you know but there is another gadget that can do all that and more so the Kingston not a uh, I know a lot of people just do not use the Kingston gadget they don't you know it stays there it collects dust and whatnot if it could virtual dust or whatever but it, you can use it for some sound effects that you may need and with the effects window with the effect window up there you know uh, you can make some nice realistic or just more non video game sounding sounds on this gadget and you might be able to get some sounds that you can use but again you can also get that nice 8 bit sound that you want to use in your music because uh, some mainstream music do like using the uh, Mostly a 12.5 wave on their music, uh, but the generic wave of a lot of mainstream music is this one. Is the uh, 25. It's the safest wave. A lot of generic games use this wave and it's pretty safe. It doesn't sound too non-organic like the square wave, but it doesn't sound too strong like the 12.5 uh, duty. So this waveform is you will hear it in a lot of uh, uh mainstream music that ever uses it if, uh, whenever you hear 8-bit sound it will just be that and nothing more no noise no triangle just that waveform right there uh but uh this is a great gadget i do love the design it's pretty awesome it's a small arcade machine and i'm glad it's part of the family it's pretty cool so uh thank you guys for joining me on this uh, journey of breaking down these gadgets and I will see you next time. Take care and have fun working on your music.